Welcome back to another episode of Podcast P presented to you by Prize Picks, a Wave Sports and Entertainment original. And boy, 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 we got another one. Another great guest. I heard this word probably twice in my life. Once from my teacher and the second time from this brother right here. Blasphemous. <laughs> <laughs> We got none other than Stephen A. Smith in the building today. What up, fellas? What's going on? Y'all appreciate you. Thank you for coming. No doubt. No No doubt. It's good to be here. I told y'all I would be here. Here I am. Yes. Here I am. We love it. We love it. You know, we got to jump. We got to jump right into it. That's right. Let's do it. You called out, you know, our brother here, Jackie Long. Right. You know, we we don't want no beef here. We not a a show of beef. Right. But what we do, we, you know, we got to bridge this together. Sure. Just, just stop, Pete. Stop. (laughs) Just stop. 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 First of all, how could I ever have beef with Stephen A. Smith? It's a legend. First of all, I don't, I know who Stephen A. Smith is but I don't know Stephen A. Smith to have beef. Right. Okay. If anything, from me, all I want to know is how can I learn from Stephen A. Smith? Mm-hmm. This is one of the greatest journalists, the greatest analysts of all time. Mm-hmm. Why would I sit back and have beef with a man that I need to learn for? I'm not going to act the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. Our show is a family-based home, and we don't have interviews. We have conversations. Right. right. And that's what I'm here today to have with you to have a conversation sure. and learn all that stuff. I can go on the Stephen A. Smith show right. and we can talk about that and have some fun. <laughs> right. I can bring you a gift. <laughs> but might, be but, careful because I might want one. Listen, <laughs> I might want one. <laughs> I, will bring, I will honestly bring, bring right. you a gift. But right. here, right. we right. like our guests to honestly feel welcome, right. feel comfortable. And at the end of the day, we get to honor Stephen A. Smith. Right. They can talk all they want to in the comments, all this. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm the greatest at ignoring stuff. Right. But man, it is an honor and a pleasure to have you, you here mm-hmm. with us. Thanks so much. I man. am glad that you came. Mm-hmm. Shout out to Sherry McGee. Yeah. I love her to death. And man, we we really is a, a, a show that likes to be nosy. Yep. You know, <laughs> we like to be nosy. <laughs> and with, like you right, said, right, right. you have an amazing, huge resume. Right. And we want to just ask you questions. Sure. How do you start that resume? And right. look. Being an actor, yeah. I'm here to actually take notes today. <laughs> <laughs> because, because I know it's something that I'm going to learn right, from you. Right, right, And, and it, like I yeah. said, man, I this love is, it. This I love is great, it. This is good. Man. This is good. So I, I'm <laughs> here. <laughs> and this is here, man. No doubt. Look, the NBA season is done, but that doesn't mean that prize picks is. Jackie, what's the next sport that's making you some money? Baseball, baby! Come on, man, my boy Otani going crazy. Give me all these home runs right now. But wait, people don't know what we're talking about. Tell them what Prize Picks is. Dallas? Prize Picks is a daily fantasy app. You pick two to six players like the video on your screen, then pick if they will have more or less than their Prize Picks projection. You aren't competing against other people, it's just you versus the projections available. With that said, I know how much I won, but Dallas. Please let the people know how much you can win on prize picks. You can win up to 25 times your money on any entry. And on top of that, all first-time users that deposit and use our promo code PODCASTP will receive 100% instant deposit match up to $100. That means if you deposit $20, prize picks will give you $20. If you deposit $100, prize picks will give you $100. And at the end of the day, you already know what it's all about. Cha-ching! Well, first of all, first first of all, you're absolutely right. I appreciate what you said to the audience because there was nothing to be angry about or anything like that. The only part that I addressed was when you said he shouldn't be talking about any, because he didn't play professional sports, he shouldn't be talking about mm-hmm. anybody's injuries or anything like that. And I'm like, hold up. Right. Can't do that because most cats in this business didn't play professional sports. Mm-hmm. And most cats that did play professional sports ain't going to be fortunate enough to be in this business. So where does that leave us? Mm -hmm. And when you think about the challenges that black folks have faced in this nation when it comes to journalism, this is one of the things when I talk about my resume, I don't talk about it to brag. I talk about it to highlight the obstacles I had to overcome to get to where I am, because what I'm saying there's only a few of us who've done it. 
obviously many, many, many more deserved it, but they got squashed. Mm -hmm. right. And so a lot of times when we're talking about each other, I'm sitting there saying, yo, man, disagree. Tell me what your point is. A lot of times I remember when Charlemagne the God came at me with donkey of the day or donkey of the week. And mm -hmm. then he came on first take to promote his book and he was ready. I was ready. And <laughs> what he didn't realize until we came on the air was that I have no problem with you because he never attacked me. Mm -hmm. He attacked what I said. Mm -hmm. Right. And my point is, that is fine. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, we all got different Everybody opinions. Opinion. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that. But when you go that next step, so you said that about me, understand, Jackie, that they're going to say it about you next month. Right. Mm -hmm. No man, they're going to say about you next year. You could be here. You could ultimately have the number one podcast. It's a damn good podcast. I'm proud of the job that y'all doing the whole nine. And no matter what you accomplish, they're going to take your words <laughs> towards me. And they're going to apply to you. Because yep. mm -hmm. what did you do on that level? Exactly. You see what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. that's what I was saying to you. I said, you want to be careful about that. Right. Because the greatest accomplishment of my journalism career was when I got named the general sports columnist for the Philadelphia Inquirer in 2003. Mm. The reason why is because this is before the advent of social media and all of that stuff. There was no Twitter. There was no Facebook, Instagram, all of this other stuff. And in 2003, when you see a guy like Mike Wilbon, Walk in the streets, walking in the NBA arena. Understand that y'all, y'all respect him. We revere him mm -hmm. because he came up, him, Bill Roden, the late great Ralph Wiley, mm -hmm. God rest his soul. Sam Lacey used to write for the Chicago Tribune. So many other cats that came to the late Brian Burwell, God rest his soul. David Dupree, both of them used to work for USA Today. Kevin Blackstone, who you still see on around the horn from time to time. J.A. Adande teaching mm -hmm. at Northwestern and stuff like that. Bill Roden, New York mm -hmm. Times. They came up at a time where they earned the license to editorialize and give their opinions mm -hmm. when black folks weren't allowed to do it. People don't realize that in 2003, when I was named the general sports columnist of the Philadelphia Inquirer, I was the 21st African-American in this nation's history to achieve that honor. Mm -hmm. Only 20 black people in the history of sports journalism will bestow that honor. Rob Parker was another one. He was writing column for New York Newsday, Detroit Free, Detroit News, stuff like that. I'm saying to y'all, as athletes, as people who, who, who vibe with athletes that know the culture and understand, understand today everybody's giving an opinion. Mm -hmm. Everybody can give an opinion. As recently as 20 years ago, that was not allowed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You couldn't give your opinion unless you were a columnist. That's Before crazy. then, you were an investigative reporter. You were a beat reporter. You could write a story. You could give news, but you couldn't do anything else. Mm -hmm. So uh, I remember a sports reporter from Sports Illustrated. I forgot his name because he's, he's, he's irrelevant now. But this brother, <laughs> he's a white dude, but I'm calling him a brother, brother from another mother. This brother <laughs> rose up. And ESPN lay some people off. He going to sit up there and write, why the hell ain't Stephen A laid off? Well, first of all, I'm number one. <laughs> Tell us the <thing>. Ratings, <laughs> revenue, Q scores. I bring money to the company. That's why I'm not laid off. Right. Value. Your ass cost the money. Right. <laughs> I bring money. That's right. number one. Number two, you know enough about the business to know what I did when I was a beat writer covering AI and the Philadelphia 76ers and covering the NBA. Right. You know what I've done over the last quarter of century covering this league. You knew that. You saw me in those press boxes. You saw me in those locker rooms. You saw all of this stuff. If I have a challenge with having a relationship with players today, it's because they got me in a damn studio all the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I don't, and they won't let me leave because mm -hmm. you got to stay here. You got to do these shows. But anybody that knows me knows when I could get to a game, I roll up at the game. You'll see me on the court. Am I mm -hmm. lying? You'll see me at the court near the layup line. I'll walk into a locker room, especially if somebody sit up there and got a problem with me. Where you at? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll show up. It's not a problem. And so to me, I've earned that. And you have contemporaries in this league, in, in, in my profession, who were white, who were trying to say, why him, why him, why him? And then I throw history at them because you've been trying to hold us back. Mm -hmm. But you didn't stop me. And you ain't going to stop me helping brothers and sisters on a come up who's coming for your ass. You understand what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. they tried to stop it. So that was the only point that I was making with you.
what I was saying to you mm -hmm. because it was both of y'all. Mm -hmm. I brought, I brought ready. up I love what, I was, I'm ready. what I was saying. What I was saying <laughs> to Paul George. First of all, understand this: I have to couch every discussion. Paul George is there's a few of them, but there's a special category of just great people. This brother right here is beloved by a lot of people in the yeah. media because of the, the man that he is. Always decent, always respectful, always straight up, the whole nine. No problems whatsoever. Always gracious and generous with his time when he can be. Except we got a lot of love. All of us got a lot of love for Paul George. My sister's kind of special, though. Because my sister <laughs> Carmen, I mean... Paul George past gas, she'll call it perfume. <laughs> I mean, did she, she, she loved, that she loves that. the ground that. that this brother walked on. And, and here's the true story. Because they played game seven against Miami. They lost that game seven mm -hmm. in the conference finals to Miami. My sister's standing by the steps where the television set is in the whole nine. And she wanted an autograph from LeBron. LeBron completely ignored her. And she's looking at him. She's trying to get his attention. He completely ignored her. And she couldn't stand him ever since. That same, get, that same night, Paul George, who lost, comes walking in and comes like, can I have a picture? Paul's like, sure, no problem. She's never forgotten it as long as she lives. She's a chef. She's, she's, she's getting ready to own her own bakery. She cooks for me on my shows and stuff like that. And she'll always ask, when am I going to see Paul George? I owe him cookies. So you, you know, she's on, she's on, she's on bed. And I didn't I bring it today because then it wouldn't be warm. But she'll be here Friday. <laughs> okay. She'll be here Friday. Okay. I, I'm just, she warm. loves Paul George so much. She'll fly in. If she flew in Friday from LA and I told her Paul George won her cookies, she'd come over to my crib, make the cookies, and then make me get in the car and drive her to Paul George <laughs> to deliver the damn cookies. I'm looking That's forward, how much she loves. I'm looking forward to she, these she's cookies. She's crazy with it. She's crazy. But she's a, and I always I always defend LeBron on that. I mean, my God, he's one of the biggest, if not the biggest in the world. Mm -hmm. He's bombarded with requests all the time. Stop dogging him and you know all of that other stuff. He, he, he can't say yes to everybody, Carmen. Mm -hmm. But she loves Paul George for that. So Stephen A, you recently mm -hmm. spoke about your short-lived basketball career. Yep. Uh, by admitting that I believe that you average less than one point a game. But yeah. what I did not know is that you said that you actually received a basketball scholarship. Yes, I was on a basketball scholarship at Winston-Salem State University my first year there. I cracked my kneecap in half. And I never, I was never able to play again. I kept trying to come back and practice, but this is in the late '80s. Uh, technology wasn't then, wasn't mm -hmm. then what it is now. I was at a Division II school. They didn't have the facilities necessary for me to rehab. I actually had to leave school for a semester to go home under my mother's insurance to rehab because they wouldn't pay for the insurance in North Carolina at that particular school because my mother's insurance wouldn't cover me there and they wasn't going to cover us there. They paid for the operation, but they didn't pay for the rehabilitation. Mm. So I never completely recovered from it. So I would come back, make the team, trying to practice, and once every 36 to 48 hours, my knee would just give out. I couldn't, I couldn't run without the limp and all of that other stuff, and that's what happened. So what I said was everybody teased me one and a half points a game. I said, no, it was less. I never played because I cracked my kneecap in half with your ignorant asses. You know what I'm saying? You didn't know. Right, 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 knee right, knee? right kneecap. I still got a six inch screw in it to this very day. They never took it out because back in the day they would leave it out. Then technology advanced and they would take it out. But by that time, it was in the 2000s. My career was thriving and I didn't want to take any time off to go back and take the screw out and have to rehabilitate all over again because mm -hmm. I knew I wasn't going to play. Mm -hmm. They told me I could live with the screw on my Lee, that's what I did. Mm -hmm. I think that's impressive. I think most people, any level of college basketball, mm -hmm. you know, everyone wants to go D1, but getting a scholarship on any level of, mm -hmm. of athletics in college, I think is impressive. And I have seen Jackie play basketball in our church league. Right. And now that I know that you actually had a basketball scholarship, mm -hmm. I think it's safe to say that you probably would have beat him in one on one. But before this knee injury, <laughs> no, I want you to talk about. Yeah, let's, <laughs> I don't know about quick, that. Quick, I don't know. Sidebar. I yeah, don't I just, know. I know the he the the fuck <laughs> up. Before, <laughs> your, before your knee injury, right. I want to know, like, what was your game like? And if you were going to compare your game uh, to an NBA player well, today, who would you compare? Well, first of all, I couldn't compare myself to any NBA player. Okay. And I think it's real <laughs> ignorant for people to try to do that. 
this is the creme de la creme. These are the greatest players who've ever played this game of basketball. When I'm when I'm going off on a player, I'm measuring him against his contemporaries, his culture. You see what I'm saying? And 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 money plays a role because it's a soft cap. It's not a hard cap like the NFL, but it's a cap. And every position that's filled deprives somebody else of a position. You see, when it, this is the thing. When you're somebody like PG, you point to the injuries. You never look at his game and went like this, he don't deserve his money. You look at his game and go like this, he deserves his money, but yo, bro, you got to get it done. But you know his game mm-hmm. right. deserves the money. Mm-hmm. I've been one that obviously, you know me, numerous players and, you know, most recently a Kyrie or Russell Westbrook, but you ain't never heard me say they don't deserve their money. That's right. never come out of my mouth. OK, because and not only that, I usually don't talk about people's money until after you sign on the dotted line because I want all the brothers to get paid. And then after they get paid, I'll be like, this, all right, now, now, you know, you lucked up. Right. Because you did that. <laughs> damn it. You know, Anthony Davis, your new contract. Look, bro, I love A.D. Love A.D. Talk to his daddy during the playoffs. I know he was a bit sensitive to what I was saying. Love A.D. as a person. Love him as a player. Sixty two million dollars. Sixty two million dollars. Let me tell you, son, bro. His talent is worth it. His consistency is not. He will show up one day. He will not show up the next. I agree. He will drop 40 in game one, 11 in game two. I agree. Now me, I'd much rather have you averaging 28 to 30, night in, night out, rather than each and every night. It's like the damn roller coaster. I mean, you had Charles Barkley calling him street clothes. You know what I'm saying? I never called them that. I called them Six Flags. I called them Six Flags. Great adventure. It is a roller coaster. It's a roller coaster ride because he's up and down, up and down, up and down. But I got mad respect for his game. I know he's one of the elite players to to in this game today. Yep. But the consistency is not there. So when people will be like, well, you know what? He's a little bit upset. I'm like, where you at? Where you at? You know, I'm not going to sit up there and argue with him in front of other people. But I would have went up to him and said, yo, bro, I said you're not consistent. I didn't say you was a scrub. I didn't say you can't play or whatever. You know good and damn well you're not consistent. Now, you can sit up there and talk all you want. I don't give a damn how great Jokic is. And he is great. Don't tell me you can't go toe-to-toe with him. You AD. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. If you dedicate it. And that's another thing we don't talk about enough. There's certain cats that want it. And there's certain cats that just want the limelight and the salary that comes with it and the lifestyle. The people that I revere are those who want it and they want it bad. All right. So from the 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 Philadelphia Inquirer to ESPN, the face of ESPN, Mm -hmm. might I add. Thank you. You've had uh, an amazing or you pioneered an amazing career. Right. Um, And for us Hoopers, like we realized when we've per se started from the bottom and had our big break Mm -hmm. in basketball, we've had that welcome to the league, you know, big league moment. Um, from a journalist standpoint, what was that moment for you? That the, the big league, mama, I made it, journalistic moment for you? Well, like I said, when I became a columnist for the Philadelphia Choir was one. ESPN, when they hired me in 2003, was a big, big deal for me because my brother had died in a car accident in 1992. And I got this in my, in my book, Straight Shooter. Um, I wrote about that. You know, he died in a car accident in Texas in 1992. I had seen him in Georgetown, uh, Maryland, about two months prior. He died about three days before my birthday. Mm. And the next 20 years, I wouldn't celebrate my birthday because that whole week, the funeral and all of that other stuff, and every time it would just hit me and it was like, man, you know, I I just felt bad. And um, my brother, the last conversation, the very last conversation we had before he passed, Two months later, he said to me, you're going to be a star for ESPN. You're going to be the number one sports commentator in America. Mm -hmm. Mark it down. You're going to take this damn industry by storm. Mm -hmm. You're going to do it. That's deep. That's what he said. And so when he passed away, I made a promise to myself that I would never go back to see him at his grave site until I got hired by ESPN. And it took me 11 years. But when I got hired by ESPN, I went to his gravesite. And I said, I did it. You know, I did it. And I could hear his voice saying to me, actually, you didn't. I said you was going to be the biggest star. I didn't say you were going to arrive. You still got work to do. Mm -hmm. And so for me, 
Um, that was a big, big moment. Um, and, you know, at that particular moment in time, humility really, really kicks in for those of us who strive to be decent. And you think about my mom, God rest her soul, and all the things that she did for me, my brother, my four older sisters, all of that. But I also thought about AI, Allen Iverson, mm-hmm. because I don't believe he refutes it, but I would have never, I don't believe I would have ever gotten the notoriety for the work that I did as a journalist if it wasn't for his crazy ass self. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he was a beat unto himself. You got the team that you covering and then there's him. And, then there's him. and all the stuff that came with him. Um, but we fought. I remember one season we went eight months without talking to each other because he was so pissed at me. Um, there was another year where, you know, at, where he was close to retiring. You know, you had cats that were in, you know, in Atlanta and they were saying, I can't come down there because he and his boys are looking for me and they going to do something. I'm like, what? Mm-hmm. You know, I got some gorillas. We roll up down there. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Where he at? Mm-hmm. You know, what the hell is that? We met up and it was one of the most humble experiences, humbling experiences I've ever had because I had written a story about, near, you know, he had gotten traded to Denver then went to Detroit and Memphis and all of this stuff. So came back to Philly and, you know, he, somebody caught him partying when he was supposed to be somewhere else or whatever. And I had to write a story about it. he got to chill with the party. And, and he um, he was so angry, he wouldn't talk to me. And I we had gone like damn near two years. And finally, I caught up with him when I went down to Atlanta. And he looked me in my face. We were in a hotel in Buckhead. He said, I don't give a shit about the story. Is that it was you. It was your name on the byline. And I said to him, I said, you know what I could have said. I didn't say anything, you know, and I got my bosses looking at me. We know what he's doing. He out there partying. All this if you don't write it, we will. So I, said, I was trying to help you. You know, he said, don't matter to me. It was you. He said, there's nobody in the industry that could hurt me but you. And that was the first time, even though we were cool, that was the first time I looked at him and I said, the brother loves me. I love him, too. And all that mattered to me was that he was hurt. And from that day forward, I told him, I got nothing to say about you until I talk to you. You know, and I've kept my word ever since that day because that's the kind of relationship that we have. And I got related, you know, I'm very, I was very tight with Kobe. I'm very tight with Shaq and various others, but AI and I is special. And so to answer your question directly, yeah, is when I got to ESPN and all of that stuff, but then there's special moments that really, really crystallizes it for you when you arrived and when he showed me that I had that kind of effect on him. Then I started thinking about all the things I say and the kind of effect I could have. Mm -hmm. And so even though I gotta be myself and I gotta be direct and I got an audience to reach and all that other stuff, I try to point out the positives with folks. I don't just say, look, you you can't play. Look, you a scrub. Look, you just, just, I always say, look, man, this person is this person. It, there's good qualities about them, whatever, whatever, whatever. But, you know, and so I make sure that I try to do that. And I hope that folks see that. Sometimes they're not going to. I get that. You know, it's well-known fact that me and Kyrie had beef for quite a long time. Um, that will probably never resolve itself. I'm cool with his family and all of that stuff now. But, you know, we don't talk and it's probably going to stay that way. Probably need to stay that way. But... I don't wish him harm. I don't want him not to get paid. I don't want people looking at him and thinking that I've even gone on national television and said, yo, we got a problem with each other. That don't mean y'all should. He a good dude. We just got our own private issue that ain't no that ain't nobody's business. He know what it is and I know what it is, you know, and so that's what it is. And we leave it at that. What does that come from? Because is, is that just the Bronx? In you, like, <laughs> it, it got to be a different. Like you, you got to be different to 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 want that confrontation at all times. I don't believe I want the confrontation at all times. I, I gotta just don't feel believe, like you do, especially I, being in this field. I just don't think I run from it. Mm-hmm. I'm not running, bro. Okay. Because first of all, 
I believe I'm right 98% of the time. Let's get that out the way. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm not, it's, it's not like I'm talking, y'all. Right. And I like, because it's facts know, behind what you say. I'm not one of these guys that is like, I'm wrong and I know I'm wrong, but this is going to create clicks. And I could give a damn about that. I, I Listen, I got a podcast, I'm building a studio. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not just doing a podcast. I'm creating a show and I'm going to create other shows. I got a production company. I'm going to create content. I'm trying to employ folks. Mm -hmm. You said I got a bigger vision than just being in front of a microphone or a television screen and running my mouth. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I understand that part about me. But when it comes to dealing with players in my in my mind, we all from the same place. We all come from the same cloth, the same culture. You ain't going to talk to me like I don't identify with you. You know, I know exactly who you are. You know, that kind of thing. And so what happens is if I say something, I believe I'm right. You got two choices. Accept I'm right or show me I'm wrong. If you show me I'm wrong, there is evidence on national television where I have showed up on national television. Yo, y'all, I was wrong. This person called me. They explained it. They got me. Chris Paul recently said something to me. I was wrong. He was talking to me about something. He was right. I was wrong. That's a correction I got to make. Mellow years ago. Oh, did he get me good? He got me good because Mellow is Mellow. I mean, that, it, that's the perfect word for him. Yeah. That, I mean, it truly is. <laughs> if you is. don't really know Mellow, Mellow is just, the, he's, he's as cool as they come. He is. And that brother called me when he was in the Olympics years ago, and he was like, had some issues with the Knicks, and he was like, why aren't you calling? He's just, why would you say that? I said, yo, man, that's what they saying. That's what I heard, blah, blah, blah. He said, and you didn't call me? And I said, Melo, you at the Olympics. He said, when the fuck did that stop you? Right. And I went like this. Damn. You got me. <laughs> he got me because he was so right. He was yeah. so, any other. I don't know. I don't. I re, to this day, I don't know what the hell came over me. Yeah. I don't know. I'm like, what was I doing that would convince me not to call him? I would always call. Why would not call? And he would answer. So it was like I had no excuse, zero. I went on national television and apologized to Carmelo Anthony. So this is the perfect question I got yeah. for you sure. right now. Sure. I got a perfect one for you. Sure. Your career so far. How can I say this? Other than coming at me, <laughs> definitely came down at me. You know, uh, <laughs> is there any moments in your career that you wish you could do over? There's several, if I'm being totally honest. Um, me and Big Dog Glenn Robinson. Um, if I see him, I'll apologize to him. Okay. It's not that what happened. I didn't report anything wrong. I didn't do anything wrong but I took it to a place it didn't need to go. And the reason I took it to a place that it didn't need to go is because I was really, really pissed off at him because I felt he got Coach Randy Ayers fired and who succeeded Larry Brown and stuff like that. In fairness, I don't like talking about it because Randy Ayers has asked me to let it go. Mo Cheeks has asked me to let it go. All of them have asked me to let it go. And the truth of the matter is I let it go a long time ago because it, be it, it needed to be let go. If it, it, there had come a point, if Big Dog Robinson and I had, had we were in a place, mm -hmm. somebody was going to die, somebody was going to go to jail. <laughs> oh, shit. Because it was like. That's that. how deep it got. Wow. It, it, that's how deep it got. Because it was like, you could see the hatred he had for me. Mm. And it was mutual. Right. Because I felt like he didn't represent the culture the way it needed to. And then I said, this is going too far. And the moment it hit me was when I saw his son. Mm. And his son was in the league and he was walking by me and it was almost like he wanted to put his head down, not to disrespect me or anything, but like he was fearful that I was going to have something negative to say, say about him. him. And I said, it's on me. I'm older. I'm the journalist. I'm the professional. He's a basketball player, not to say he's not a professional and a grown man, because I'm not trying to disrespect him like that. Um, but there is no excuse for a player to be in this league whose father was in the league. And it was like, yo, you know, you worry that I'm going to come at you the wrong way because of your dad. I said, there must be something about my presentation and my delivery that's irresponsible. And I walked right up to him 
And I apologize to him for what has happened with me and his father. I said, when I see your dad, I'm going to I'm going to apologize to him. And I want you to know you don't ever have to worry about me saying nothing about you. I'm going to call your game now. Right. I'm gonna play. I'm going to give you credit. I'm, mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm going to critique your game now because that's my job. But that's all you ever have to worry about. That was one. There is no denying, even though I hate bringing up his name because it just <laughs> gives him a reason to, you know, gain attention. But Kwame Brown. <laughs> look, man. Uh-oh. Look, oh, shoot. look, look. <laughs> Kwame Brown, I know what I said. I did mean it. I ain't going to sit here and tell you I ain't mean the shit I said. Mm-hmm. But I didn't know it was going to be like this. I didn't know that. Remember, I said it before Twitter, Facebook. I didn't know, man. I didn't know that 20, you know, 20 years later, 15 years later, they won't have memes and videos. I didn't know, y'all. I really, really did it, man. And and when I see what he says, I realize how hurt he is. And no matter what he said, no matter the bravado, no matter how hardcore he comes at it, I know. You don't do stuff like he does from time to time and talk about people unless you hurt. There's no way. And so I just said, like, damn, if I had to do that all over again, I would have just, you know, I mean, it was a sound bite. They, they had just traded for Paul Gasol, and <laughs> they asked me this question, and I'm like, what? Yeah. You know, and I, was, and I mean, I'm, be, I'm talking like I'm talking. Y'all see how right, I talk? Right. It ain't like it's reserved for television. That's how I speak, yeah, you know? Right. Sometimes I'm more mellow than others when I'm talking to honey. I mean, it's a little different. <laughs> We're talking about a little different, but when, when, I'm, when I'm talking to the fellas, it's, a little, it's, it's, it's different. Yeah. And we just talking. And so I, I look at it like that, man, yeah. and, and, I, and, you know, you just look at him and, and you see some of the stuff that he's saying and stuff, and it's like, yo, dude, it's like you that you that hurt, you know. Like, and the one time I had to address it because I felt like he was coming at me like I was scared. I'm like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, <laughs> let me remind. First of all, I ain't scared. Let me remind you, these are the highlights, you know. And but but I can't even tell you when I did that. The stars who call, mm. I ain't gonna mention, I ain't gonna mention no names. Practically all of them was Hall of Famers. Mm. All of them. In the Hall of Fame, they're like, nah, Steven, nah, nah. And the only exception to that would be my man DC, Derek Cohen, because that's my brother right there. And he got on me, and when he speaks, I listen, because he's a real one, and I got a lot of love for him. And he was like, nah, nah. And I was like, where were y'all? When he was saying all of this stuff right, for weeks, right. you know, I didn't say anything, and, you know, and and, and him and and Jamie Foxx and, and and so many others, man, and it was like, all right, y'all, I ain't gonna say nothing. They like, we know you ain't scared, we got it. And as I see, you know, some of the clips now and some of the stuff that he says, I just be like, go ahead, bro, say what you gotta say. So, you know, I, I wish I could do that over. I wouldn't do it. I wish I could do big dog. I wouldn't do that, um, you know. And to certain respects, believe it or not, Kyrie, you know, um, because I think that that got misconstrued. You know, to me, you're so spectacular in box office. I'm tired of seeing one thing after another leading to you missing games. That was my only point. There's always something. Yeah, I, I want to leave Cleveland. I'll stay here in Boston if you'll have me. And then you leave and you go to Brooklyn and it's one thing after another. After you got the brothers to come to Brooklyn where well, you should have went to the Garden. You'd have been worth about a half a billion <laughs> more playing for the Knicks than for the yeah, Brooklyn, Brooklyn Nets. And so that was my position. Is that a little biased there? Huh? Yeah. Yes. Totally. Sure. Totally. <laughs> totally. Totally. I mean, listen, 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 I'm praying. I'm praying on camera for Damian Lillard to be considered. You know, I love South Beach. Less taxes in the whole bit, but New York, and I'm praying for him to come. Damn right. But but the thing about it is, is that when it when 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 that stuff happened with Kyrie, you know, he and his father and I are fine. But it got to a point where it wasn't because unbeknownst to the public, the father loving his son was coming to his defense by sending me text messages that quite frankly, I didn't appreciate. And so because of that, it took on a life of its own. And credit to Kyrie, I mean, listen, it it, is really nobody's business, but I feel because the story took on a life of its own, I really, really owe it to people 
to let them know I'm, I'm not I hope I'm not violating Kyrie's trust because I usually don't I don't you know I don't I don't betray people's trust that's just a big thing for me but I will tell you we were at the Staples Center and Kyrie rose up on me uh Lakers Memphis Grizzlies he rose up on me I think it was I think it was, it was either that or Denver he rose up on me he taps me on the back and he's like you still got that same energy face to face I said I'm standing here ain't I <laughs> and he was like, it's really not about me anymore. And I looked at him and I said, you're right. It had become about me and his dad and how we had elected to communicate with each other. And the shame of it is I'm 55. Obviously, his father is around my age. And the younger son was the one that had to educate us. This is really about y'all. Mm hmm. And so I just said, that's what men do. Kyrie Irving is right. And I called his father. And we resolved everything and we met face to face and it's no problem. I said to him, I'm still gonna judge your son by what I see. But this notion that there's gonna be personal animus or whatever, I thought I was just doing my job. If it looked differently, that's on me. And so, you know, real knows real. And when you're a man, you own up and you fess up to the things that you did wrong. Right. And I'm gonna always be that dude. I'm gonna always be that dude. Mm. Well, I gotta be nosy. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta get nosy, cause I get nosy. Yeah. And the reason why I'm saying I was nosy, you brought up something when you brought us up on your uh, show for True. all your accolades. It was some accolades that you didn't bring up. Okay. You get into the acting world now. Yeah, man. See, yeah. a lot of people probably didn't even know that. I told you we nosy. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, I heard that you, uh, you played Brick on General Hospital. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's, that's right now too. That's still going. Well, oh yeah, right I was now. on. I was on Monday. I was okay. on Monday. I was okay. on Monday. <laughs> I'll be on again uh, the twenty eighth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, you know. It's talk, fun, talk, man. Free promo. Yeah. 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 You know what? You know what it is. You know what it is, man. You know what it is. You could come up to me and 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 I'm good. I don't like signing autographs. I'd rather take pictures. You know, take the pictures and you know keep it moving. That kind of thing. I'm not debating for free. Right. You're not getting that from me. You don't roll up on me in the supermarket, you roll up on me in the <laughs> restaurant. I remember, God bless him, I had to stand up and, and literally hug this like 70, 75 year old white man that came up to me. I don't like what you said about the Knicks. I said, stop right there. <laughs> I said, I don't debate for free. Don't even try it. And you could see him taken aback and he was disappointed. And I walked up to him and I said, sir, it's not personal. I just don't want to do it because if I do it with you, I got to do it with everybody. You know right. what I'm saying? Don't take that personal. It's all right. Took a picture with him. Everything was good. But it's very few things in life that tickle me more than old people, <laughs> white, black, Latino, whatever. And these old men come up to me, uh, sir, I watch you on the ESPN all the time, but that's not why I'm here. I'm up here because that little old lady over there, my wife. Watches General Hospital all the time. And she can't get enough of brick. You want to see me smile? Glad I just start glowing. I just say, I say, of course we could go take a picture. Where is she at? Of course we could do it. I love it, man, because, you know, first of all, I, I don't consider myself an actor. They do. The star of the show, Maurice Bernard, who plays Sonny Corinthos. Vi uh, uh, Eric Braden, who plays Victor Newman on Young and the Restless, is a personal friend of mine. These dudes think I'm a natural. They think I can act and stuff like that. And they've been insisting that I take it more seriously because they think that I could do it. I think like I get where they're coming from in this sense. I saw uh, the movie, the LeBron and them movie uh, with Adam Sandler and then with Anthony Edwards. Mm. I thought if I, let me tell you something right now. I do a movie, I produce a movie, <laughs> especially with a sports figure. I'm getting Anthony mm -hmm. Edwards. But that good. brother did a phenomenal job. He, was, he did. Phenomenal he was job. He was natural. He, he was unbelievable. He yeah. really, really was. And I love it because here's what I've come to appreciate about acting. You can be anything the role says. Indubitably. You can be anything the role mm -hmm. says. And think about that. No matter what we're doing in the world today, you have to watch yourself yeah. with everything. Mm -hmm. Cancer yeah. culture that we're living in a whole bit. Not acting. At all. Acting, it's the role. Mm -hmm. Whatever the role says, you can get away with being it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love. See, for me, Nino Brown, 
New Jack City. Right. I'm the white Nino Brown right now, the white shirt. Now, <laughs> last night I had on the black. It would have been, it'd have been Nino <laughs> Brown. I, had, I, I went to the Taylor Swift concert with my daughter. I had everything but the damn fake bull, the fake dog that Martin <laughs> brought. I'm setting the scene, stuff like that. It's hilarious. But I mean, stuff like that, I think about. I think about a role like that. I think about, about Creed. I think about Creed. Well, he was, Creed in, was, he was in Creed. Yeah, but I was myself. He was himself. I was myself. Mm. Yeah, you know, I did it. Michael B. Jordan reached out to me. That's my brother. I love him to death. He said, yo, man, I need a favor. I need you to do this done. No problem. Come mm -hmm. to the studio. Let's do it. And that was it. But that was me and my element. Mm -hmm. So to me, there was nothing challenging about that. So how far you see yourself going with, with the acting? Because I know I, you, you hands on doing all the... The journalist work, but how far you think you go? You I go? don't know. I really, I really don't know yet. I think anything that I put my mind to um, up here, you know, I can pull off. Physically is a different matter, knees, health, all of that other stuff. But up here, anything that I put my mind to, I think I can get done. You got so, a dream role? You know what? Like I said, man, you know, it's hard to think about that, but I think about Ghost from okay. Power. I think about. Uh, uh, Denzel and Malcolm X. I think about stuff like that. Nino Brown. You ain't thought, about, you ain't thought about me once? Say what? <laughs> no, about me no I did not. I did not. My, my bad. But 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 your time is coming. Your time is coming. Okay. Look, listen, listen. We all start. And I meant that sincerely. It wasn't an insult. I like we all start somewhere. Listen. I was hurt that you didn't know Jackie Long from ATL. I did not. That's what I was hurt about. I didn't, I didn't, listen, I work all the damn time. I don't get a chance to watch everything, bro. But he got and and here's, the thing, here's the thing. I'm a law and order fanatic. Okay. Like season three with Sam Waterson all the way to like 21, 22. I watched every episode. Martin, comedy, mm -hmm. every episode. Mm -hmm. I go back to the honeymooners, Ralph Cramden, like one of my all-time favorite comedies. All that. And then you have your favorite movie. Like, I love. All the Mission Impossible movies for Tom Cruise. All of them, mm -hmm. you know. Top Gun and all that stuff, that's all right. But Mission Impossible is it for me. Denzel, um, I can't get enough of Training Day. Can't get enough of Malcolm X. Stuff like that, you know. So you see stuff and you just, when you get downtime, you want to watch something like that. Outside of that, I ain't going to front, man. I TV General Hospital, bro. I go home and... I catch up on yeah. the episodes, you know what I'm saying? I watch that. I watch that. I mean, it's not a joke. I mean, when I'm working, everybody knows. Everybody knows. You better G8. have a damn good reason for bothering me from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern time. Oh, when man. General Hospital come on, he know the time. you better not. You're locked in. You better not bother me. If I'm, well, I swear to you, we gonna have a problem. It better be good. Cause I don't like missing. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Well, welcome to Act the Gang, man. <laughs> Do my thing. Yeah. So, Stephen, your former colleague Skip Bayless yes. has a new debating partner yep. in Richard Sherman, and I want to ask you if you could go or pick any NBA player in the history of the NBA to go back and forth with and have a debating show. Who would it be, and why? Well, the obvious answer would obviously be Charles Barkley because of what we see him do. Um, he, you know, we see him on TNT for so long, we forget the brother is a Hall of Famer and one of the all-time greats. Didn't have a championship, we understand that. Jordan stood in a lot of people's way, and 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 Barkley has to own up to the fact that to some degree he stood in his own way, uh, because a lot of t there was some times where you know what he wasn't in the kind of shape that he could be in, et cetera, et cetera. But I would tell you this. The person that I would love to sit on a set with me or across from me any day of the week is Kevin Garnett. Hmm. Why is that? Because he's a real one. Agreed. I'm good with you. Respect. I'm Agree. Good. Your ability to, first of all, being real is one thing, but your ability to articulate your position with presence and force matters. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, we would have to talk to KG because FCC airwaves this brother sometimes don't pay attention to that you know and, and so and so that 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 that's the deal with him you know but 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 um kg has been i remember one another 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 time when i had to be real then you know it was early on it was like damn i forgot which year it was it was like maybe 2001 maybe 2002 i'm not sure he pulled me to the side because i was getting on michael ola with candy too hard. And KG was like, damn, bro. Damn, you know, come on, Stephen A. Blah. And I was like, okay, I got you for you, you know. And back to Kyrie, I had a couple of cats call me that grew up with his dad that are friends of mine. But the biggest people is 
His godfather, Rod Strickland. That's my man. We go back a long ways. And of course, my brother, Kenny Smith. Kenny Smith called me and Kenny Smith was like, yo, he's, a, he's, he's us. He's one of us. He wasn't just talking about black. He was right. talking about, you know, where we right. from, Queens, Bronx, all that stuff. Steve, Steve. He said, this ain't right and wrong. Right. He said, this ain't about your information. I get it. He said, but damn, you got that pulpit. And I told Kenny, I said, say no more. Mm -hmm. It's you. It's you. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's you. And it's like, listen, you know, we don't talk much, but, you know, I'm talking about Kawhi. I'm talking to somebody else. Paul George can roll up on me. Yo, Stephen A., can we talk? I need you to got you. Mm -hmm. No problem, because that's how much love and respect I have for him. Now, there's several other players. You don't have no chance in hell of it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The way you act, you ain't going to come up on me like that. But yeah. anybody that I have a relationship with, I'm going to listen to. I'm going to respect, and um, I'm going to make sure they know they can influence me. I'm not a closed book. Mm -hmm. And as a journalist, you have an obligation not to be a closed book. You're all supposed to be open-minded. You might be right a lot, but when you wrong, you got to own that shit. You got to own it. Huh? You got to own it. You know, I remember I was telling Draymond, I went on his podcast, and, you know, you're sitting up there, and, you know, DeMarcus Cousins, and, you know, he and I button heads. I knew how he felt about me and shit. I didn't give a damn, blah, blah, blah. And next thing you know, he reached out when he heard what, I said on Draymond's podcast, I ain't had nothing against him. You call him like, yo, man, ain't nothing to talk about. We good. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I respect the manhood. You know, you had a problem with something I said, but that's over and done with. You know, because I look at a guy like DeMarcus Cousins, and I don't like the way he's being treated. You know. He still got game. He like got that. game, bro. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I'm not going to rest. I'm not. I, listen, you got people looking at me, and he's not a fit. I'm like, shut the hell up. DeMarcus Cousins right now would be a top five big man in basketball. Yeah, right now. Period. Mm -hmm. was right the last team he was on. In the right finals? now. De uh, was it Denver? Was it Denver? Last, last Denver. Team? He was with the Clippers he before that. He went to Denver. Right. And, and listen, we ain't always had the greatest relationship, but we cool now and the whole bit. And ain't no way in hell that man's supposed to be in Puerto Rico playing basketball. Right. Now, right. you might have, oh, man, he, he shouldn't have been so acerbic and truculent. He shouldn't have been this way. He shouldn't have been that way. All right, y'all. Come on, man. Where's forgiveness at? Where's compassion? Where's understanding? Yep. This brother has a game. He does not deserve to be in Puerto Rico right. playing basketball right, right now yep. with his skill set, his body, his strength, his basketball IQ, his shooting ability, everything. He would be a top five player. Right. And I think that you got people in the league ostracizing him because of a personality he once had. Yo, man, we all make mistakes. Yep. And he is somebody that I think is going to be a better man for it than he was maybe earlier mm -hmm. on. Don't tell me that he don't deserve a chance and close a book. So I could have been like, Psst, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, nah, I'm not going to contribute to closing the book on this brother. He don't deserve that. Mm -hmm. He don't deserve that. And you know, and so that's the kind of man that I am in the platform I have. I know who I am. I know that I'm blessed and fortunate enough. You know, this is God given. I, I mean, I earned it, but still a lot of people earned it. They don't have the opportunity I have. I'm on the air 10 hours a week, minimum 450 hours a day. You know, not only am I the talent, I'm the executive producer. You see all of those people on first take, handpicked by me. Mm -hmm. I picked them. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't pay them. You know what I'm saying? The <laughs> ESPN paid them. Right. And, but they let me pick who's on my roster and stuff like that. And so when you are blessed with that kind of reach, that kind of influence, you have every obligation to be fair. And what I want people to know is that I'm going to always strive to be fair. If I believe I'm right, I'm not budging. But if I believe, it, but if you convince me I'm wrong, if I said something on you, about you on national television and you said that was wrong, I'm going to go back on national television and acknowledge I'm wrong. I'm not going to sit up there and say something publicly, but then privately we go. Right, no, no, right, no, no, no. Right, right. You said I, I said something publicly, I'm going to go right back publicly and say it. And you'd be surprised how many punk ass people won't do that. Right. We did it face to face. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Squashed, <laughs> See, you squashed about, it. <laughs> we did that. Um, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned, you know, being on Draymond's show. Yeah. There's a, you know, we're growing in this space now sure. from, the OGs doing it with yep. Matt Barnes, Stephen Jack, yep. myself and the younger yep. generation, Pat Bev, you know, right. all of us jumping into this podcast mm -hmm. world. 
with the success that we've been having in this space, mm -hmm. what's your honest takeaway from us being, as athletes, being in this content space? I'm incredibly proud of y'all. I think that there's a lot of people in the business that won't admit it, but they don't want y'all to from succeed. From a competitive standpoint? They don't want y'all to succeed. Um, but what I would ask you to consider is that have some compassion for them who mm -hmm. feel that way. Because mm -hmm. here's what they're not going to tell you. You getting 35, 40 million already. This is our job. You successful, you take, you take more opportunities away from it. It's almost like an actor that you out there working hard to perfect your craft and they striking, but we, we, we ain't worried about y'all. We got reality TV here. You see what I'm saying? You taking jobs from folks. And so they're not telling that. I've been blessed and fortunate where that's not a concern that I have. And so because of that, you know, it's like, then I look at the other side to it. I'm not just a black man. I'm a brother. And so when I see brothers out there diversifying their portfolio and maximizing the opportunities that will potentially be available to them, not only am I rooting for y'all, I have an obligation to help you mm -hmm. if you ask. That's why when they said, Paul George, once you come, I'm there. Mm -hmm. Draymond wanted me, I'm there. Mm -hmm. You know, because I want him to succeed. I want you to succeed. I want everybody to succeed. I think there's room for everybody to believe it or not. And I think that you have a lot of people that they don't believe that y'all are gonna be completely authentic and honest with one another, A. They don't believe that you're going, that you're, you're really, really going to invest yourself in this industry, number two. They think you're doing it just to kick out the fourth estate, which is the media, and to talk amongst ourselves. And my attitude is, that's your problem. You know, Draymond and PG and KG and, 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 and Matt Barnes with stacks and all that, that don't stop this train. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. You know what I'm saying? Right. I got my audience. Whatever, and it's my obligation to go out there and get an audience. Right. And so to me, y'all got something to be worried about because there's people that's coming and they don't really want you to succeed. But in the same breath, you sort of don't have something to worry about because you got a brother like me watching y'all back who's in the industry. Mm -hmm. So it's like, Matt Barnes is doing his thing and they got more numbers. I just started with, you know, my, 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 my YouTube channel. I mean, I got 275,000 subscribers in, in four and a half months and it's only going to grow mm -hmm. and I'm going to do what I'm going to do. But I'm looking at all the smoke. I'm looking at three, three, the old man and the three. I'm looking at Dre. I'm looking at you. I'm looking at KG. Remember when KG did that thing with Paul Pierce. So I called Paul Pierce out. I didn't call Paul Pierce out to jab at him and excoriate him. I'm like, what you doing? That's your boy. That's your boy. You don't do that. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, image. you you rolling at ESPN and you talk about what's happening. All right, that's the mouse. You knew better. Okay, we ain't going to get into all of that. But you knew better. You know the rules that come with it. I, I can't do certain things working for the mouse. Right. Period. It's the mouse. All right? Get over it. It's the way. They're the number one distributor of content in the world. You're working for them. There are rules and regulations that come with it. You deal with it or you don't. But when it's your boy, and you on the set with them, and you you all zooted. Come on, bro. You you. Then I wasn't trying to get at Paul Pierce. I'm like, yo, that's your dog. You know he don't want that. You don't do something like that to him. Yeah. That's what I was saying. And then in the case of, of Stax and, and 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 Matt Barnes, man, I'm so proud of those brothers. And and I don't think that people realize this. Matt Barnes is a Brilliant brother, man. Smart as shit. This brother, yeah. I mean, if you sit, talk about looks and how it can be deceiving, because you know, you, you see him tatted up, he's smoking some weed, and then he right. talk about he want to be in politics. Right. And I'm like, this. <laughs> well, how the fuck that gonna work? You know what I'm saying? I'm like, I'm like, I'm like what vote you getting, right? And then, I, and, then, and then I'm like, you talk to him, and I'm like, oh shit, he, he, he pull us off. Right. Why not? Why not? Right. Look at some of the politicians we got on Capitol Hill. He he could pull this off, you know, like because he's just a brilliant mind. And then, you know, you look at stacks and we, we've had our disagreements and stuff like that. And I'm like, come here, man. We disagreed about that. Mm -hmm. 
you and I good. Mm-hmm. You know, it, like, you know what I'm saying? This is Steven Jackson. Mm-hmm. Oh, real a warrior. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. this brother don't. It's, it's like you see what they do. And, and Dre, Dre crazy, he emotional and all of this other stuff. But but show me a better brother. Show me a better brother. Show me a brother that 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 is real. He's authentic. He 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 wears his emotion on the sleeve. Sometimes unwisely at time I get it, but his heart's in the right place. He knew when that shit went down with him and Jordan Poole, he was wrong. He knew that was indefensible. But I know him well enough, and boys in the league know him well enough. His boys, that is, to know what he was going through at that moment. Right. And that he was going through a lot. That ain't none of our damn business. Mm-hmm. But I'm one of the people he confided in. And I understood. I got it, you know, and I never repeated it because that's his story to tell. But I knew it. And so I had a different take on it. So my point in, in, in all of it is understand the platform that you have. Understand that it's growing. But the one advice that I would give, stop falling for the same old stuff that most of these athletes fall for when they say the media, the media, the media. No. If you're going to be in the media doing a podcast and everything else, you have an obligation to dissect specifically who you support and who you're against, Mm -hmm. who you think favors you, who you think don't. It can't be it's just the media. You know what I'm saying? It it, it can't be that because when you do that, then you castigate in everybody. And that's like a cat in the NBA. All right, this cat got arrested for junk and driving. All right, this cat had a domestic violence issue. All right, this cat is arrested for assault. And white media, like in years past, not necessarily now, but definitely in years past. You see these NBA players? Right. No, they it was three of them. categorize everybody. It was three of them. Yeah. It was three of them. But I feel in our perspective, right? This is our work. This is our livelihood. This is our job. Yep. And 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 I and I felt this way for uh, mm-hmm. part of my career. Sure. Um. Of like, damn, I'm off the media too. Yep. I don't want to talk to this person. Yep. I don't want to talk to that person. Leave me alone. Right. right? They beat me up enough. They've said mm-hmm. this thing about me. Granted, like I'm trying the best that I can. Sometimes I come up short. That's cool. I got to live with that. Right. That's not for you to dissect and tell me I should have did this. I know what I gotta do. Mm -hmm. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? So when it comes to that, it it comes to a point of like, at that point, I'ma just remove myself. Got you. And I'ma take myself away from talking to the media. Right. Because regardless what I say, it's gonna come out the wrong way anyways. Whatever point I'm trying to make, they gonna Mm -hmm. take that and run with it. I got it. And so that's what brought me to the conclusion Mm -hmm. of doing my podcast. Right. Because now I can express how I feel, I can say what I want, and I know it's coming straight from the mouth of me. I don't got to worry about clickbait. Someone, he, I had this conversation with mm-hmm. this personnel, mm-hmm. and this is the, the part that he wanted to put in right. his story. Mm-hmm. It's coming from me now. It's my story. That's cool. And you're right to do that. Mm-hmm. You're not wrong. Mm-hmm. Right? So anybody that tells you you're wrong is wrong. Mm-hmm. But there's a flip side to it that you might not have considered. Mm-hmm. Did you know? That if a reporter walks up, let's say, for example, Paul George is, yo, man, I think I'm worth 50 million. I want this contract. And then you're struggling. Do you know that if that reporter goes up to you and doesn't ask you about that, the editor's like, come here. Why do I have you on the beat? You going home. You got to understand that Everybody has a job to do. A lot of times, particularly if it's a beat writer and it's somebody that's in that locker room after every game and is talking, is cultivating a relationship with you, they know you. So the last thing they want to do is come up to you and ask you that question. They have no choice because their job is on the line. And no matter how bad your game was that day, your contract guaranteed. And it's for a gazillion times more than that journalist made you know you got cats that and and they're gonna remain nameless as players because i'm not gonna do that to them but when i went hard on a couple of superstar players i happen to know for a fact they tried to get a couple of journalists fired and it's because the journalists asked them about something that they were hearing and they brought up the brother 
But when Woes reported it, or Shams reported it, you ain't say shit. <laughs> now see, that's when Stephen A, now that, that Bronx, that Queens dude comes out. Oh, so we going to call a brother out making 75, 85, maybe 100,000 that they can wipe off the map in a heartbeat. And you fucking know it. And you would do that to him. But the white dude, whoa, champs, whatever. And I, and I work, Woj and I have a good relationship. Respect the hell out of him. He's the ultimate insider, stuff like that. Shams does a great job as well. I'm not, I'm not throwing no shade on right, them. Right, right, right. I'm saying I'm watching the athlete. You said nothing. You said nothing. And that's when you see me, you like, what's wrong with Stephen A? Why he coming like that? What's going on? Because I'm pissed because I know Intel and I know what you're doing and I know how you tried to do it. You sit up there one time and it's like KD talk about people don't know what they talk about. And I love KD. That's my dog. I love him to death. But he was talking about people don't know what the hell they talk about when they were talking about him wanting to leave OKC. And you're going off. Mm -hmm. But then you left. You left. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? They weren't lying. They weren't lying. You know, I mean, it's like you 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 see cats and it's like, yo, you you making tens of millions per. You getting mad and trying to end the careers of cats. Cause if they get fired, how many brothers gonna get fired? You working at Yahoo Sports, you working at ESPN, you working at some other network, and you get bounced out. How many brothers you can look at and say, yo, you're gonna have another job tomorrow? It ain't like that. And it doesn't, it doesn't ever cross their mind. And so for me, I understand what you're saying, but I would give I would use Roy Williams, a former basketball coach in North Carolina. He was at Kansas. They lose the national title game. And the reporter has to ask him, are you going to leave Kansas City? Kansas, is this your last game? Are you going to North Carolina? Now, who the hell don't know? That's the worst. That's the absolute last question he wants. He just lost the national title. He got kids in the locker room crying. Nobody wants to do that. That reporter had no choice because the producers in her ear and the, the bosses are back in the studio. You better ask this question. And by the way, it's not subliminal. They literally have an IFB in their ear mm -hmm. and they're telling them, ask the question. <laughs> mm -hmm. Ask the question. The difference between me and most, I have the power to take the IFB out. Shut the hell up. Mm -hmm. I ain't asking that. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm going to ask. Mm -hmm. But even I have a tenets of journalism that I have to ask. If you sat up there and just got arrested last night and you come on my show today, I got an obligation to ask you what happened. Look at Hugh Grant. He, he got caught cheating on his wife years ago. He went on a late night show. It was comedy. And Jay Leno opened the interview. What the hell were you thinking? And the whole crowd burst into laughter. That was his way of having to address what needed to be addressed because it comes along with the tenets of journalism, which you as athletes don't necessarily have. That doesn't make you wrong. That doesn't disqualify you from having a podcast or anything like that. But understand your role is different. Malika Andrews, my colleague, who everybody saw I got into an issue with on first take months ago, and I had to check that situation. She getting crucified during leading into the draft because she's asking Brandon Miller a question or bringing up somebody's past. She had an obligation to ask those questions. She did her job. If she doesn't do her job, she's off the air. They're like, what well, we need you for. And so when you see athletes and you recognize the fact that you have enough access to us if you don't know to find that out. Wouldn't it be nice if you just asked? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll tell you. Yeah. We'll tell you. I think though in that you brought it up with athletes, like this is the field that we, this is what we signed up for, right? Yeah. I think that goes in the same tone with, with journalists, right? Okay. This is what they signed up for. Right. So I think it's tough for you guys to ask us because it, it's it's an emotional sport. Sure. Sports in general, it's, 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 it's an emotional right. uh, ride. Mm -hmm. Whether we're winning, we're losing, mm -hmm. good times, bad times, shit that we got to carry from home into our field, right. vice versa. Right. Like it's, it's, it's chaotic at times. Right. And I, and I think 
you guys can tell the story of what it's like being just human beings. Sure. You know, I think a lot of the pictures that being painted is that we're superstars, we're superheroes, we can do this, we can do that. Mm -hmm. We're put on this pedestal mm -hmm. of, of being able to, you know, mm -hmm. conquer anything, right? right? Um, and that's, that is the biggest issue that I have mm -hmm from a journalistic standpoint that mm -hmm. you guys fail to realize, mm -hmm. hey, we fuck up too. Right. You know, well, shit don't go our way too. Well, we all understand there's winners and losers. Everybody can't win. Everybody can't win, right? But there's two things that I'll point out to shine a light on, the, uh, on what we're talking about, to give you an example of what can be annoying. So you'll have a situation where you like somebody like KD, who I consider to be one of the greatest players who's ever lived. And he's like, it, we just want to play ball. And we all the same. And, 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 and it's a team effort and blah, blah, blah. He said this in the past. Did you say that when you went to the negotiating table? No. You're damn right you didn't. You that, said, I'm special. You said, I'm special. I am not like anybody else. That's true. And, 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 and I'm not talking about the public. Yeah. I'm talking about amongst the NBA ilk. I'm talking about cats that are a part of the fraternity of 450 plus players. That's it. In the world. You still went to the negotiating table and said, I'm one of the best. We expect to see that shit. And if you don't show it to us, we're going to point out, that ain't what you said at the negotiating table. You see what I'm saying? You got LeBron. He used to drive me crazy with this. And that's why I came up with the tick on, on television. When I said, great dad, great husband, great director, great actor, great businessman. I did, I did all of that. I said, did I miss anything? Did I miss anything? Because I got him as the second best player in the history of basketball. I got him ahead of Kareem. I got him behind no one but Jordan. And I said to Mr. Chirper himself, Chris Paul, I mean, Rich Paul, my boy. And, and I said, you act like that's an insult. <laughs> this dude, it is an insult. I said, get the fuck out of my face. Get the fuck out of my face. This is exactly what I said to him. I don't want to talk to you no more. You can't talk to me about it. When you're going to treat me like I'm disrespecting a man by calling him in the history of the game that started in 1947, you're going to tell me that I am disrespecting a man by having him number two all the time. You have lost your damn mind. I'm not talking to you. And so what I'm saying is this. You got cats that want the lofty accolades. They want the, the, to be renowned for this. And they want to be recognized as that. But LeBron, and you know this, you're going to start laughing when I say this. Because he's done this before. LeBron. Because I'm the best in the world. Doing the finals. Remember that? He's playing against the best in the world, which he was. And you know, that's how he felt, blah, blah, blah. They lose. <laughs> Another year wasn't the same series. Another year. You know, I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to be the best father that I could be and, you know, be a good role model. God damn it, nobody's talking about that, man. You know good and damn well we talking about that damn jump shot you were shooting where you shot two for ten. Stop it. You know, we, we nobody's questioning your character. You didn't ball that day. You didn't ball. Why, why, why are you going to go there? You trying to be slick. You're damn right he did it. And it's like, you, you, you're trying to be slick. Can we stick to ball, please? Nobody questioned your character. Nobody sat up there and said you're a scourge of the earth. You're not a role model. We don't love you. We don't care about you. Yo. You fucked up. You played bad that day. You play good tomorrow, but you play bad. And for you, this is important. Write this down. <laughs> it's for me. Come on, Stan. Soap operas are a beautiful way to do a podcast and a beautiful way to be a journalist. If you watch Young and the Restless, Victor Newman has been shot. He's been pushed down a flight of stairs. He's been stabbed. He's been beat up. Uh, he's lost his memory. He's been kidnapped. You know, Sonny Corinthos, General Hospital, been shot. You know, shot his own son, was supposed to go to jail for life, and, and, and all of this other stuff. Fellas, they're the stars. They're going to be there six months from now. Mm -hmm. a year from now but it doesn't stop the soaps from telling the story yeah and that's what you're missing 
Paul George gets paid what he gets paid. My brother, you deserve it. We know you can ball. Anybody with two eyes know that when you healthy, you one of the best. There's no doubt about it. We know what the Clippers could do. We can only imagine what you and Kawhi fully healthy and y'all fully loaded with Ty Lue coaching. We only can imagine what y'all could do. We know about the greatness of LeBron James. We know about the greatness of Steph Curry. We know all of this. But the story has to be told. If all you get to do is point to their ending and the narrative, you can't tell a story. And they can't do their jobs. And the thing that I love about y'all having a podcast, y'all going to find that out. Because when you come in front of this microphone and these cameras, you got to have a story to tell. You got to have a subject to address. You have to have interesting and compelling content to provide to the viewers. How can you do that if everybody has the attitude, well, this doesn't matter because we know what's going to happen in the end? No. You tell the story while it's going on. I might, I felt in my heart of hearts the Philadelphia 76ers were going, were going to the championship. I knew they were going to lose to the Lakers with Shaq and his prime and Kobe and all of that stuff. But I thought they were going to beat Toronto. I thought they were going to beat Milwaukee and all of this other stuff. If you go back and look at my coverage from 2001, it was back and forth. They love me one day, hate me the next. I'm like, damn, he sucked tonight. You're like, what was he doing? How could you make this mistake? But this is the kind of thing that's going to cost him. I knew it wasn't going to happen again. But I don't get to say that. I get to sit up there and say, in the moment, this is what happened. These are the potential ramifications. That is what makes a story. And you're going to do what that. you got to do. And I'm fine with that. I'm, I'm, I have no issue with that. Right. The issue I have is that Y'all, y'all fail to realize that nobody wants, like we don't go out there and want to perform bad. When you are a professional athlete and you put your skills on public display, it's there to be publicly scrutinized or lauded. Because what we're doing is we're separating the good from the great, the great from the greatest, the good from the scrubs. You understand? There's certain people we can look at and go like this. But there's a role for them. There's certain people we look at and say, pretty damn good. This guy, going, he's going to be, you know, when I looked at Terrence Mann a couple of years ago, I said, this brother got a future. Okay. There's certain people, like Norman Powell, Norman Powell, brother can ball. I like Norman. We get all of that, right? There's certain people like yourself and others, a star, star, star. And there's certain people who remain nameless. They don't have no business winning and be a uniform. And we all know it. And so when you see that, okay, you have an obligation to point out those things, not to belabor it, but at that moment, that's the story. You have an opportunity to make a different story next game. Now, the playoffs is when it's different because the playoffs, you got to live with that shit the whole offseason. You do. That's where first take comes in. That's where the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast comes in. Let me tell you something right now because ain't nobody – Ain't nobody stopping me. And I am I feel good. I'm feeling healthy. I feel blessed. I am more energized for this NBA season than I have been in a long, long time. Yeah. I'm so ready because it's like, yo, we got nobody's in a real ideal situation, which means it's going to call upon the stars to lift them up. I'm ready for it. I've heard it. I've seen it all. Yeah. And I'm ready for it. This year is going to be a good one. We appreciate you coming through in the building. Blessing Podcast, P. Yeah, Ladies and you, gentlemen, gentlemen yeah, we have to face uh, ESPN. Huh? I said, we want to get in there. Come on. Appreciate you coming on. It's a pleasure having you.